Welcome to the Steps Travel Podcast. For us at Steps, travel isn't simply about destinations and sites. It's about people, uh, about meeting people. The travel is all about connections. Um, sometimes they are uh, unplanned, sometimes unconditional, but it's very much about those connections. And trust in strangers is very much the essence of travel. Uh, the kindness of strangers, an affirmation that people are on the whole good. Now, there's been much focus on the carbon footprint, especially that of flights. And whilst that's good, we at Steps like to emphasise the positive and the positive impact that travel can make, whether it be to travellers or indeed to the local communities with which we work. And for us, that's really important, especially the local communities, not least in helping them uh, to protect the biodiversity in which they live. And for us, one of the biggest challenges facing the planet is the loss of biodiversity. So in our podcast, uh, we seek to explore the positive benefits of travel through conversations with writers, travellers, uh, guides and photographers. And thus it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Paul Goldstein. Paul is uh, a wildlife uh, photographer of uh, much renowned. He's a guide, he owns camps in Africa, and he, he's a conservationist, he's a fundraiser, but above all, he's outspoken. Is Paul, is Paul on live now? Ah, here we are. There Finally. Finally. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, I, I don't know if you heard my introduction about you, Paul. Uh, it was obviously, it was extensive. obviously glowing and extensive, as you said. Um, the, one, the one word I did use is that you're outspoken. Which yeah. Which maybe a bit that. ironic because we couldn't hear you at all. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and also very poor with um, computers, laptops, and particularly Instagram. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> well, we're here now. So, do, do, you like, do you consider yourself as outspoken? Yes. Yeah, on just about everything, actually. If uh, I think each morning I, I wake up and I find some subject to find me rage fueled, fueled by rage. And there's quite a lot of it about at the moment. Uh, and it's not just uh, it's not just uh, conservation. Uh, it can be politics. Uh, it, I think vaguely sort of it's, I suppose, loosely um, tiered around injustices. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't care whether it's a traffic warden, a poor decision from a referee uh, or corruption or whatever it is. But yeah, that, that would be it. So we, we won't go into politics or Arsenal. Oh, good. Yeah. So, but, I, but what about conservation then? How can, how can, what can, I don't know, what's, what are your frustrations in the world of conservation and, and, and what are you doing to try and uh, change that if you can? Well, many, I think, first of all, with signature species, Justin, with, with, um, with animals that really count, uh, the, the, the big ones, you know, elephant, rhino, tiger, uh, and they're like, they get plenty of money. Uh, they do. Uh, unfortunately, appropriation is always the, the key. Uh, and it's the two things, you know, in, in the developing world that we're never allowed to talk about. Um, one is corruption and the other is, is birth rate. Uh, and you have to tiptoe around them. But if you, if you sorted that out just to a degree, uh, you know, maybe 5%, 10%. These animals would survive for our lifetime and more. So that's number one. But, you know, raising money, which I've done a lot of, and uh, I suppose showing concern and mounting campaigns and writing to your MP, all of these things are important. But unless you address it at the root cause, um, which is where the demand is from, the problem's never really going to go away or it will just emerge. Uh, you know, you shut down one avenue, it'll open somewhere else. Uh, and I'm afraid to say that, um, that area is always in, in China and Southeast Asia. Uh, and it does strike me as extraordinary that a country like China, where that so much is placed on, on face, uh, you know, on impression and, and not embarrassing themselves, how they can imagine that, that, that this, this traditional medicine with, with zero pro provenance um, medically, um, I, I kind of think they're not buying it because of that. They're buying it because it's expensive, just like people buy caviar or foie gras. And, and in, in the introduction, I was talking about local com communities and working with local communities. Mm. And I know you do uh, a lot of that with Kachechi, one of the camps that you, you, you own yeah. uh, in, the, in the Mara North Conservancy. Do, do you want to tell us a bit about some of the work yeah, that you do I, there? And, and... I mean, there's a lot. We have a full-time staff involved at Kachechi just on uh, responsible uh, tourism, uh, the, the sort of community trust uh, we have there. But very importantly, when you raise money in an area like Kenya, on the, in the conservancies or wherever it is, it's very important you don't engender a feeling that, OK, we've got some money now uh, and we'll wait for the next handout. If you get local people behaving like that, 
I'm afraid you've lost because uh, it's like boreholes. You know, people think it's, it's a great sexy term. It's like boreholes. 88% of boreholes in Africa don't work. They're broken. They're vandalized. The parts are stolen. So it's very important that it's sustainable. And once you start it off, it should then invigorate itself critically. Uh, it it okay. really and so, so what are you do, doing differently at Kachechi then in, in terms of... Uh... Well, we've, um, well, first of all, it, we have empowerment centres. It's, it's, let's be clear, uh, Maasai environments is a very male orientated and that's being polite uh, environment. So uh, we've always approached uh, women, um, wh wh whether it's beading centres, empowerment centres, getting them to work in our camps. You can't just throw, you know, people often say you don't have enough women working. I know. I wish we did. And we're working at, we have, you know, many more than we had four or five years ago, but um, it's, that's a constant work. The other things, of course, it's education and water. Those are the crucial, mm -hmm. uh, they really are. Because if kids can't being, aren't being educated and they're not drinking clean water, you have a problem anywhere. Yep. Uh, and then what about your photography? Do you think you're outspoken in your photography? Is there anything you're trying to do in the images that you take? And you, uh, I, I, I think I, I read once that you, you said that those who believe by taking pictures of a certain species think that they're helping those species are, are morally corrupt. No, I think, yeah, I, I get a little tired of, of pious photographers just thinking their work is enough. No, it's not. Come on, you've got to do more than that. Uh, that's why I'm involved in a foundation in India, stuff in Kenya, you know, all sorts of different charities. Um, that's important. It's not just enough. But also, you've got to remember, it is just a photograph. You know, I saw the other day, Justin, somebody said, I'm not a photographer. I'm a capturer of light. What? I, I, I'll, tell you what I'll tell you what you are. Uh, <laughs> but it's, I, well below the watershed now. Uh, but, yeah, look, I think people just get too, um, I suppose, almost up themselves about photography. They really do. They think it's everything. It's not. It's a medium. And if photographs can help allied with strong text and a strong campaign, yes, it makes a big difference. I mean, it makes a difference commercially, uh, but also, you know, let's be clear, uh, I take a photo of a poached elephant and it's used correctly. That can make a difference as well. But just don't think it's just the photograph alone. Uh, generally, I have a lot more respect for, for these people who pretend that they're just guides and, you know, they're doing so much. You get, put some skin in it. Really, if you care that much, as you put some of your own in. And you mentioned words there as well as the photography. I think that you you, you pride yourself in some of your captions. I think the uh, calf measures, uh, rock stars. <laughs> w w w which captions? Oh, have... I, I, well, I always say if I haven't written five hundred words a day, I haven't written enough. And yes, I've always enjoyed the English language and I consider myself a punsmith. I like to write a pun a day. And some of them are excruciating. Both you and, and your colleague, Jared, would wince at many of them. But uh, the, the point is, if you can do both fairly well, you're more valuable than somebody who can just do either the written or the f photographic word fairly well. And I think with the camera, what, when I photograph just for myself and I'm not teaching, I'm trying to take a photograph which somebody else hasn't. So either that is a unique situation. And when I judge competitions, I'm normally looking for, I think, um, what, I, what am I saying? is something that's original or also a good degree of difficulty. I like to see some graft. Conversely, that's not easy. You know, when, 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 when you say a good degree of dif difficulty, you mean sort of in technically? Uh, well, both technically. No, physically. I want to know <laughs> frozen for two months uh, at minus 30. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they, they have sort of career defining injuries uh, from their quest, but, uh, but they get the, uh, they get. So, the so, so, so what, are, what are some of the more challenging environments that you, you worked in and you photographed? Well, them? certainly uh, Atlantic, uh, South Atlantic in uh, Antarctica, certainly Baffin Island, minus 27. That, that'll present a challenge. Snow leopards is, uh, I, I think if people go out thinking snow leopards, oh, it's just like photographing leopards with Paul in Africa. No, it's not. And you have to approach it right. You, you approach it as a quest. It, you know, you see a snow leopard inside a kilometre, it's considered a good sighting. It's desperately. But where, the other... Where... Where were you for photographing snow leopards in, in, in the Himalaya, in Ladakh? Yeah. Or in... No, I haven't been to Mongolia, but that was in uh, Ladakh. Yeah. Uh, and it's wonderful. I, I, I love Ladakh and I approach it. And when I've done it as, as a whole spiritual quest, because you go there. First of all, the people are Ladakh is they're mainly Buddhist. And most of them are, uh, as you well know, uh, refugees from the ravages uh, from Tibet. They call it Little Tibet. Thirdly, it's a beautiful country. 
fourthly, you know, most of it's land, you know, you can't get into for eight months of the year because of the snows and the altitude. Fifthly, they are incredibly hard working. And sixthly, they largely hate the Chinese. So, um, you know, there's a lot going for it. Uh, I, I love it. I really do. Um, the other point about photography is it's the sort of new light through old windows. And if I can um, take a photograph that's been done before, but maybe using a different technique, a slower shutter speed or something, at least you're trying. And if I, when I judge photos, and I, I, you know, I've just been guiding last week, and I, I look at photos the whole time, I would far rather see a flawed, ambitious photo than I would a... Um, you know a safe one a chocolate box one i'm just going to put a little bit more light in here um yeah so uh and that's not always easy uh you know getting uh, safe shots is always the easy way out I, i'd prefer something much more ambitious even with mistakes and so say with the snow leopards i don't know where were you rumbuck valley or, or yes uh, uh, no it was in uh, i've done it two um two places um in um in ladakh it was hemis and uh, ule and then uh, I presume you were there February, March time, maybe, sort yes. of, uh, and, and obviously very cold. And if you're in Baffin Island, the South, South Atlantic as well. Yeah. How do you, uh, kit wise, what do you, what do you do? Or how do you prepare? And certainly from a camera yeah, I mean, perspective it, as well. It's, it's hard. And I, I, I miscalculated last year and I'll probably have, you know, issues with my toes for the rest of my life uh, from uh, some frost nip last year. But, you know, people wear, wake up with a lot worse. Um, so, yeah, you know, you've got to have a proper kit uh, in Bath and you hire it. Um, but it is important. And uh, you know, I had some people who flew out to Bath because they couldn't hack it. You know, they thought Gucci was better than Canada Goose. You know, it really isn't. Um, and they suffered for it. Uh, but also sometimes it's just the hours. You know, you go to, well, I mean, let's take a good example on the Polar Pioneer with you guys uh, in June. You know, there's 24 hours of daylight. I have had people on that ship go to bed still in their boots and not take them off because they're so sure I'm going to wake them two hours later at four in the morning. And I will. I'm not going to wake them for, a, 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 you know, a single, uh, I don't know, glaucus skull. Don't get me wrong. It's a fine bird. Uh, but um, for a polar bear on ice, well, of course you will. You know, why wouldn't you? But after, day after day, that begins to take its toll. Uh, it really does. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, but yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're selling it quite, you, you, you're saying that on the Poland Pioneer, when they come with you in June, that there'll be no, no sleep in effect. Yeah? Uh, uh, not no sleep, but a kind of particularly, you know, if you find something good, you don't on, on one of my expeditions and it is an expedition. Let's be abundantly clear. This is not a cruise. There's no shuffle. There's no two sittings at dinner. Uh, there's none of that. This ship has the, the polar pioneer is the hardest, the toughest hull, which means you can play in the ice. You find a bear with a cub or two cubs on ice and it's relaxed or inquisitive. Uh, we're not going to sail off. And if they fall asleep, I suggest you do as well. Uh, that would, no, I mean, I, I've done that. Uh, and I, I, I've always said this and, and people um, with photographic expeditions, Look, it's our job and it'll be my job in June and on any on any expedition or safari or whatever I guide. And this has always been Kichetsch's way that you're trying to work longer and harder than anyone else. You're trying to get people um, in the most extraordinary situations. How they choose to record that is down to them. That's why I frequently get lots of people who don't even bring cameras. They bring very good precision optics, binoculars. Uh, because they like the way we go about game. They like the way we go about wildlife. You know, do all the work before. It's like a good photograph. Generally, all the work is done before. You know, the, the finger fusing with the shutter release is 5% of it. That's all. Um, the field craft, the patience being a, a must rather than a virtue, the gambling, the utter zero fear of failure, um, the audacious nature of it, a little bit of technical knowledge, all of that should... Um, culminate until finally pressing the shutter as opposed to some people who think a frankly witheringly ludicrous array of waistcoats camouflage and gigabyte after gigabyte you know just leaning on this that's not photography that's just accumulation it's boorish it's dull and it's frankly often intrusive and rude so, you, uh, you, you were just talking about what to wear. I, I think I've seen you in a black tie uh, in Antarctica with some penguins at one stage but uh, <laughs> that aside oh. Touche. Very <laughs> touche indeed, yeah. Uh, but that was a very, <laughs> I was going to say that was a very long time ago. I needed the money. No, not. 
it was, you know, Justin, this, that's a, I'm so glad you brought that up because about two years before that, I saw a photo of a guy stood on the ice amongst some penguins in a tuxedo. Now, great, great idea, brilliantly conceived, but, but, but not well executed because it's a tux. So I thought a morning coat, a.k.a. a penguin suit, is, is sartorially on brief. And so with, you know, st stringent baggage, baggage allowances, I took it down. I was working, uh, so I put it on. I put my float coat over the top, which is Velcro clad, and then went and hid amongst the penguins, tore it off, and then just walked through the, the colony. And I think it's the only time, and um, certainly will be the only time, that I ever felt suddenly that there was, it was a ship, obviously under 100 berths, as the Antarctic Treaty says, uh, and then suddenly all these lenses are just pointed at me. Uh, I don't know who took that one, actually. Uh, I don't. But yes, uh, that was an extraordinary, the, the, a sort of pap moment, not to be repeated. And so when you guide, you said that a lot, a lot of it's down to preparation beforehand and sort mm -hmm. of, say, the Polar Pioneer, getting the right, the right uh, vessel, the right ship to get you into situ, right. et cetera. Uh, so yeah. when, and, and when you're there with clients, are you, how much sort of technical advice are you imparting or you just play it by ear in terms of... Uh, they will get lots, but not too much early on but you know as well as i do is if, if you pick up a, any whether it's a new laptop and you're, well if you're like me and somebody you know you want two or three uh pointers to start off with and two or three more it's very simple if people write them down they'll remember them and, but uh you know i know the glazed look uh I, I go on to something a little bit i get that a lot uh I go on to something a little bit advanced. from your wife though yeah uh, yeah yeah uh, oh, not just her. It's not mutually exclusive to her. Uh, but yes, probably more often. And it's hard um, sometimes. But it's a job that you know, I always say this it, it, it for, I always say it about my guides in Kenya. You, know, you can have the most charming, uh, the most eloquent. They know the gestation periods, know this, that, and the other. But you've got to find the stuff first. That's always job number one. Uh, and frankly, one polar bear on ice is worth a dozen on land. You know, that's the rail and the other lovely thing of course about it's like if you photograph a penguin exploding out of the surf every photograph is going to be different if you do that number one number two if you photograph um a polar bear on ice of course the ice formation the mosaic is different each time as well so you know that's a real thrill uh it really is um and yeah particularly if you're on a zodiac you know last year uh, on the same ship uh, the expedition leader, who I know very well, he's worked for donkey's years. He'd only, he, the most he'd done were three long excursions in a single day. One day we did five. He'd never done it. No way, he'd never worked with me before. Uh, and it was extraordinary. And I, I, I was talking to somebody yesterday, he was still reminiscing about it. Uh, yeah, okay, they were on their knees at the end of it. But it's not like you're breaking protocols um, with, with, with safety or anything like that. But people have spent, let's be clear, Justin, as you, you've been in this game long enough, um, they spend eye-watering amounts of money on these. You've got to deliver. You really have. To. And you have outside influences like the, the vagaries of the faunal world and, of course, the capricious nature of weather, particularly in extreme areas like, like the Arctic and, and the like. So you've know, you got all that daylight. You've got to use it. Yep. No, and I'm sure you will, and it would be, be an amazing trip. So we talked about some sort of challenging environments. What are, what are the other environments that stand out for you in terms of where, where you've uh, photographed? Or, or I think it's... For me, it's sometimes species-led. Polar bears have always been a, a big thing for me. Uh, cats, uh, predators is what I love more than anything. I really do. And I've spent years of my life with cheetahs and leopards um, because I heard somebody say uh, in Wilson Airport uh, last week, they'd obviously been before, it says, oh, we've seen everything. What? <laughs> really? And I asked, I said, I mean... Uh, you, you, you just you just been in Kenya, I presume, in the Mara, but uh, and you had a uh, you got some footage of a, a cat was it a leopard uh, with some lions chasing it up the oh, tree. Oh, that was extraordinary! No, no, that was only that was not far from camp at all. Um, and uh, yeah, the leopards had a a kill stash. The scent brought in some jackals. They made a holler, and um, they brought in um, some hyenas and then four lions and some males try to climb up the leopard got pretty uh, bleak about it actually actually the leopard actually crapped on if you look at the video really carefully i didn't spot it but someone pointed this leopard has crapped twice on the line i'm sorry it wasn't a a, a a form of offense but um yeah it was and it was only 12 minutes from camp and also critically that's in a conservancy it's not the masai mara reserve yeah. 
be abundantly clear. It's chalk and cheese. You know, my guides are, you know, the, the qualifications in Zimbabwe and Kenya. Do you, do you, want, to, do you want to explain the difference between that? What, what, what that yeah, is something to the conservancy? Very, very easy. It's three, in the conservancy, if you're staying in the conservancy, you want to go in the reserve. I haven't been in for a long time. You can. You can't do it the other way around. You have to stay in the conservancy. It's 350 acres minimum per guest, five vehicles maximum at a sighting. Um, which, which makes a big difference here. Yeah. Be, you can drive off road. You're not having okay. to look over your shoulder. Uh, oh, you're a foot off road. That'll be six thousand shillings. Um, no, it's it's the future. It absolutely is. But the most important thing is you're paying one hundred and eighteen dollars a day um, conservancy fee, which is audited. In fact, anyone who stays at Kachechi, over a third of what they pay is going into the community. So all stakeholders, the cattle owners, or whatever they, and also we need a bridge, yeah. a new road. We need something reinforced. It gets done. Um, and it, it, it really is. And I'll be honest, uh, guests buy into it massively. Uh, they really do. Our repeat business is, is massive because it's not as much as you want to say it's just down to your, the camp and your guides. It's not. It's down to the whole ethos. And my partner, Greg, was, you know, right at the vanguard of when this started in 2006. He started the first one. A couple of them did. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful. Um, and I'm it's, very. It's a wonderful model, not least because of community involvement in it. Well, and I wish it happened. Way forward. Forward. Yeah. But it doesn't. I mean, in Tanzania, yeah. even the guides don't. Need, there isn't. Aren't any qualifications? Yeah. I mean, yeah. um, just, just back to the leopard in the tree with the lion. That was obviously on video that you shot that. So, do you, do you flip quite a lot between video and still? Well, I didn't used to, but the phone I'm looking at you now. I mean, it's not a fancy phone. It's a. It's an iPhone. Uh, I don't know. It's an iPhone 12 or something. Now, I mean, I didn't need to switch it to 4K then, but I really strongly recommend this. I always say, you know, if you've got a situation with wildlife and it's close and the light was great, the bossier tree was only, you know, 20 meters from me. I strongly urge people to film it, but make up your mind between either one. I said, right, I'm filming this. And you get the camera steady, exactly all the tenets you would use for photographing. Imagine you're showing to your children, Justin, if you'd been there and you'd seen all that. And do they want to see 15 photos of the lion sort of climbing or do they want to see a 20 second video of that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's really, re never mind about social media. I think you're showing it to your relatives. You remember in the past, people say, oh, come around and look at my holiday photos. You know, yeah. you're not that excited, are you? It was in the dining room. It was the only room that, that's got space. Uh, you're not that happy about it. But a little video, particularly with the editing you can now do on it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, it really, so, yeah, I'm becoming a big fan of that. Uh, and um, your colleague, Jared, will laugh enormously, knowing he knows full well what an exponent I was of my little Nokia. Uh, but now I still consider this a telephone, not a cell phone. And, uh, but uh, it does make a huge difference. It really does. And, and just getting technical at the moment, in terms of camera, what, what do you use camera wise? Or it depends well, on, I, it, on the, the, what you're going to try and shoot yeah, and where yeah, you are. In all I, I get, I don't know how many emails, how many communications I um, work, you know, correspond with a day. Uh, about uh, about cameras uh, because it's it's constant, Justin. Uh, it really is. They're always always asking that. Should I go? The big question: Should I go mirrorless? Listen, yeah, do it. It's lighter, it's quieter, and it increases your chance, your percentage of getting better photos. Have I gone? No, no, I haven't because I I don't know. I'm I'm okay. Uh, with my heavy old, you know, at the moment I I see, need to see the physio quite often to get my shoulder sorted, but. I, as long as your camera's half decent, the, the money you should spend is on your lenses. Uh, that's the thing that makes a huge difference, Justin. Um, exactly the same as binoculars. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you have a good pair. Yeah, I went, you know, when I was a youngster, you know, oh, I need binoculars. These ones are khaki. That's tough. No, look at the glass quality. Same as a good pair of sunglasses. You know, no, I, I, I totally agree. My, my father in law from a wedding present many, many years ago gave me a pair of uh, Swarovski um, binoculars. Oh, oh, and they're, they're still just so fantastic. And they will outlive you. Yeah, uh, they will. They, they're, they're amazing. Uh, they're, they're, they're outstanding. I feel naked without them. Any yeah. It's the first thing I reach for in the morning. Before the toothbrush, where are they? You know, and I think I lose them in the vehicle at Kachechi at least four times a day. Uh, but, you know, they're always there. They can, 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 I just, can I change tack a little bit and just talk yeah, about some of, the, some of the fundraising that you've done um, and, and sort of relates to sort of conservation as well? Um, uh, and you raised over two hundred thousand pounds for worth more, more alive. Do you want to? Uh, uh, sorry, twice as much. Then actually, okay. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. 
No, no, no. It's fine. Can, 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 tell us a bit, bit about what you did and, well, and where the know, money's I, going and what, what it's, what it's I, doing. I, and, and small adventure companies, you know full well, I worked for Exodus for many years, and, and, and particularly back in the day when it started, uh, the then um, marketing director, uh, not a dissimilar character to you at all, uh, or, or, or Jared, um, was very supportive. And the point, very simply, with, with, with that in particular, and, and I, had some, I did the Everest Marathon, it was the last marathon in the suit, last um, May, and um, I had some very dark days on the mountain, um, Justin. I really did. It, 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 was, it was a big undertaking. Um, and I'm a person who, some people are filled with reason. Some people are filled with honest debate. I'm filled with rage. And the thought that it's ridiculous that tigers should be endangered. It's absurd. I would like my children as well as your children to see them in the wild. Uh, and I coined the phrase, and it was simple arithmetic. And this uh, translates to other species. Eight, I've seen this so many times, but it's, it's a, uh, I suppose, a mantra that I have to keep saying. If you take a poached tiger, you put it on the slab, you use all of its parts, its hide, its teeth, its, oh, goodness me, its pelt, its penis, its blood, its bones, it could be worth north of $35,000. That's a lot, and that's going to go to a few people. If you take a female in any park, Rantenbor, Band of Gar, where, which is where, where I favor, um, where a panna, a pinch, and she has a full life, and she has four or five litters, and you take all the ancillary benefits. And when I say that, that's the rangers. That's the guides, that's the drivers, that's the park officials, the guy who cuts your hair in the village, the restaurants, the lodges, the camps, all of that. You know, that figure can go well north of 50 million. That's a lot. So um, is, is, are your pages, uh, can people still donate? Are they still live? Yeah. Or, and, and, and so if they do donate, where, where does the money go? Where does, well, where where, go uh, education is the big thing. Uh, we have a, a, another program uh, looking after, uh, it's a big problem with uh with as with all wildlife uh human predator conflict that's a massive problem so you've got to get people out of the park collecting wood so we've done a big thing with gas ovens with sustainable boilers all of those sort of things so that that's that's very very important uh it really is but the most important thing with predators and with conservation is it's not uh that the sort of love affairs people say oh i want to save the tigers well you can't just give them money they can't eat it they're not interested in it um You've got it's got to, it's pragmatism that saves them, which is very unsexy. That's why when you see often, not all, but most celebrities getting involved with wildlife, um, they are interested in it purely for themselves. It's that sensitive look. Let's just massage the sensitive part of my CV uh, before I take another project. If you look at people who really care, they're the ones who make enemies. It's no secret Chris Packham's a good friend and he makes enemies as I do. But my God, you try arguing with him over it, you'll lose. Uh, but he's have, you, have you got any more sort of fundraising plans? Any more challenges that you're going to be doing? Um, yeah, watch this, <laughs> Justin. Oh, watch oh. this okay. The problem uh, being, Justin, is that is that the tiger suit currently it, it's not incarcerated, but it resides in a tea house um, of several you know hundred feet above Namchi Bazaar. So it's going to need to be retrieved. Uh, and I would like to think um, an airline who brings it back would be a little kinder than the last one who were took, took it out. Just two questions. Well, a quick question about the tiger suit. I've, I've foolishly done the, the marathon in a rhino suit before. And then also in, in a gorilla suit. Now, the gorilla suit was painful because there's a lot of chafing. Was there any chafing with the tiger suit or not? No, it's no. But, uh, and I, I did London Marathon in 97 for Save the Rhino, but I didn't wear the suit because you can't see out. And that's a problem. If you're going to wear a suit, you want the reaction from the crowd. The crowd yeah. uh, okay. That's lifts you no it's just awkward um it doesn't fit that tight it's based around a rucksack the real problem with it justin is that it, if it's windy yeah. i mean actually you're putting a, a spinner so, so watch this space for future fundraising what, what about sort of future travels apart from sort of polar pioneer in june what are you doing in between are you off anywhere uh, fun, no, interesting? Uh, not a lot i'll be going to baffin island in march uh and i always say the best polar bear photography if you like baby cubs straight out of the den and aurora is you know aurora photo has become enormously popular over the last years and as someone said to me that did, were people just not seeing it before it's nothing to do with that aurora has been around 
you know, since the world has been around. Um, the point is, is 30, 40 years ago, cameras weren't good enough really to record it, mm -hmm. you know, because it's dark. And film cameras, you really, you were guessing. Digital format now, uh, that you know, with so little noise, people can do it. You know, you can film it on a decent uh, cell phone now. So that's, but always with a photograph. It's not just the Aurora. If you showed your children 12 photos of the Aurora by about six or seven, they're like, yeah, whatever, Dad. Uh, it's very colorful, but I'm over it now. However, you're saying, but this is unique. Each formation is unique. Look at the colors here. Now, <laughs> it's what you take it in. And if I, you know, just a, cup, a hill with a few pine trees, you know, I'm done with that. Or if you're taking sculpted, grounded icebergs of 10,000 tons with that in it. Yeah. And I still maintain, because I've seen polar bears on icebergs on this trip, grounded icebergs. And still there's that, you know, I often talk about the best shots I've never taken never taken yeah that's one okay that's a polar bear on an iceberg in the aurora don't want much but also i think of the times there's two particular instances uh, justin of, of a photo i could have taken but i just it didn't happen once was two male lions dashing towards each other and i was trying to line them up with a glowing sunset it was on the horizon and like 20 meters short they dropped down off the horizon then they jumped up and clashed jaws and of course it didn't happen but a much better one was in uh zambia i know i know you know zambia and in, in south luangwa in the what do people from shoreditch say oh, in the valley oh the valley uh but anyway there with the, the marvelous uh bush camp company uh just magnificent company and um anyway we're, we're, we're sat um in uh in the river uh, in a deck director's chair you know the scene you know the the the, the gig and about 300 meters behind, there's a carmine beta colony. Now, as you well know, in, in, in my ever evolving top 10 avian list, um, carmines will always be there, as will a Marshall Eagle, as will a Snow Petrel. Um, and it's a beautiful sight and it's tough to photograph. You can't get too close, so it's, it's an attritional thing. Anyway, we're about two, 300 feet away, just having a drink. And you can hear the constant uh, bird call. And then the, the, the cadence just changed. And it just went up a level and we both turned round, and there's this cloud of carmines above the bank and a lioness peering in between them. Oh, my. and for a nano, we saw it. Uh, and that's a retirement shot. But no, and then what do you do? You've got to laugh. You know, there's no point. You know, You've got to laugh. And so, I'm not patronised. Oh, I'm sure it'll happen again. No, it won't. So um, what, what's the one animal or species that you've not photographed that you, you would most like to? Pangolin. Pangolin. No. Don't tell me you've seen one, please, Justin. Uh, well, you know what I have. I was in the in, in the CAR and oh, was, hang on a second. Hang on. I, I, there, there was there was a young a young boy was selling one. He'd obviously caught it, oh, and we 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 no. bought it from him. We took it down for a couple of miles down, and then released it in the forest. Um, okay. So there you go. Anybody listening? There you are. Yeah. Sustainable tourism in a nutshell: a dichotomy of sustainable tourism. Yeah. Without tourists, that pangolin isn't in the wild. Yeah. Uh, that is. I, I often uh, joke and laugh, and, and Jared is an exponent of this, and I'm sure you are, of the, of the when, when, you know, I think probably the three of us spend, uh, and many people I've worked with in the past, spend a lot of our lives uh, extolling the virtues of places, speaking passionately and enthusiastically uh, uh, about um, various um, uh, countries and game parks or whatever it is. But there is, it's not a fine line, there is a line between that and then the itinerant one-upmanship I'm always listening out for, which is always on my fifth visit to Burkina Faso, you know, not just once. And they're always talking about their food, you know, when they do their olive run in, in, in September in Tuscany or whatever it is. And that was a beauty, if you don't mind me saying, because, you know, it, it, you know a pangolin, just a pangolin is not enough. It's Central African Republic. But I'm delighted. Okay, I, 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 I'm sorry to one-up you. There's, there's few things that I can one-up and ship you on, and that, that would be it. So That's a beauty. Um, How much do you pay for that, by the way? Sorry? I, I can't remember. Pay for I can't remember if but... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's, also, that's a wonderful story, which I'm now going to tell, uh, obviously, many times. Uh, and it sounds like one of those coded messages to the French resistance after the World Service. A pangolin has been released. You know, after the news, they would say, and, and, and that means that they have the landing at DF. I love that. That's a great story. Yeah, go on. Keep going. I, well, well, I, 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 I'd love to keep going, but I think we're probably running out of time. And so, I, my, I, know, I know you've got lots more time on um, but uh, well, one last question for you then. I know that you're you're a mad keen sports fan. Mm. Uh, so apart from Mikel Arteta, uh, the manager of Arsenal, which other sports person would you most like to meet and why? Then? 
No, no, hang on. First of all, you've got me completely. Yep. You've made a catastrophic error there. Uh, even though I'm not one of those supporters. No, I'm afraid I'm from the other side of North. I know you're from the other yeah. side. That's why I'm uh, saying it on purpose. Oh, no doubt you're an Arsenal supporter. Um, I'm not. No, uh, very, very simply, uh, are, in terms of sport, I... Let's be abundantly clear, and I apologise to, 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 to the, the people listening if they think this is sanctimonious. I'm a sports fan first, and I'm a Tottenham and England fan second. I find it astonishing that people are talking with sort of jaw-dropping um, surprise about England's test cricketers now, this baseball, uh, like it's some revolution. So these guys have actually decided to make it entertaining for the supporters Who'd have thought that would work? I mean, please. That's why. I've... So, so, who would you like, who would you most like to meet then? I've always liked the Mavericks uh, in any sport. You know, give me Alex Hales and John Butler any day. Uh, you know, in and... in football, obviously, at being a Tottenham boy, I was I was a massive guy. I've been to an old firm game when Paul Gascoigne was playing. I've never seen anything like it. And... Uh, Question. Last question. How would that apply to conservationists then? Would you think the same about conservationists? The, the no, conservationist who, who is a maverick that you'd most like to... Yeah, meet? that's a, a really good... I mean, obviously Jane Goodall, we all hold, um, and, uh, and Attenborough. And, and I'm going to say it, uh, he's my friend, Chris Packen's my friend, but you, for, the, for conservation to work and for species to survive, you, number one, you mustn't be afraid of bloody inks and noses. Number two, you mustn't be afraid of making enemies. It's like photographing. Don't be afraid of failure. Um, and number three, you've got to have an end game. Uh, you really have. It's not just about raising money. Uh, it's about education. Uh, and do you know what, Justin? Often I despair. And when you, when, you're, when you despair, and I'm sure you do as well, uh, and you, there's one word that will drag you out of it, often kicking, and that's saints. Wherever you look, there are saints. It could yeah. be a guide. There's a guy in Huangi. I've heard this from a number of sources. In a little municipal campsite, I understand he has not been paid his salary through the government. And if it was in Zimbabwean dollars that don't even exist anymore, it wouldn't be worth anything. But I understand he hasn't been paid for over 20 years when, you know, in line with when the country went badly south from bringing a breadbasket. You go to this campsite... There are flowers around each area you drop, you put, you bring your backy or your car in, you put up your tent. You could eat your dinner off the floor in the toilets. Um, he knows the elephants by name. Um, he's an Enderbeely guy and he's not only a saint, he's a hero. We still have heroes out there. Those are the mavericks. Those are the real stars of the show. They really are. So, I, I totally agree with you. It's wonderful to hear about this Enderbeely guy and I'd love to find out who he is and maybe maybe to try and get an opportunity mm -hmm. to meet with him but you find um, so, every, so you just it, have to look for them you, you talked about sort of not being af afraid of failure and different things so are you optimistic or are you pessimistic about the climate change and the and the challenges facing us yeah i'm 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 desperately worried about it. i mean justin you've only got to um open the newspaper uh, or You've got to end on a more positive note than that, Paul. So. Yeah, no, no, hang on. If, 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 you know, 20 years ago, you got extreme weather conditions um, every four or five months. Now it's, it's almost every week, including in this country. Um, I think all it needs is one or two individuals. And they are out there. My God, they are. You need a sympathetic minister. You, re you realise that with climate change, you're going to have to bite the bullet. And, and when you have governments who want votes who are then telling people to use more expensive energy. Um, it's hard, but it, it, you know, we, we shouldn't, and they're gonna get the electric cars right. You know, we, with our grid can't contain it at the moment, but when those electric cars half in price, which they will, it's just gonna be like unleaded fuel. Everybody switched to it. No, I think that there's areas are, I, uh, and I don't believe official figures uh, when they start saying this number of species has improved, but I've certainly found you know, it's one of the advantages of everything being immediate now on, on, on a phone or something, that more people are engaged. Oh, goodness me, they are. And, you know, whatever, whoever it was who said, whether it's Mark Twain, or, you know, or whoever, I can't remember who it was, you know, it starts with one step. Uh, and if people realise that pragmatism and um, passion, but as well, you know, a whisper of rage, uh, I think it helps. And tour operators have got to play their bit as well. It's not just about space. Uh -huh. I, I think I think you're very right. You talk about pragmatism there, and I think that, that 
we, we've all, we all have a voice and we all have to use that voice. And I think we all need to be, dare I say it, a bit more like you and a bit more outspoken about different things. So, um, Paul, an absolute pleasure to, uh, to chat with you. I'm really sorry about the sort of the technical no, no, no. things we had no, at the beginning. like that, Justin. It shouldn't be all slick. It's a, this isn't some sort of boardroom <laughs> or something. You know, the, you know you're, you're, I can see a map of the world behind you. You can see a, a library behind me. That's where it starts. That's the hub. You know, if this was some ivory clad uh, tower with, uh, you know, Ikea furniture and the sort of masculine, that's not how, it, that's not what it's about. Uh, all of this should be, should be underwritten. Uh, by and I think it can be underwritten by tour operators. You know, you have an agenda on every one of your holidays, and a good one, and a sensitive one, uh, and that's important. And greenwashing is is a crime, and it should carry a custodial sentence. Far too many operators have talked about caring, and you, oh, we contribute every holiday, and it's a couple of pounds. It's nothing. That's to do with their shareholders. That's to do with just feeling good about themselves. No, that's why the great projects are normally done by the people who are not making a huge song and dance about it. Great. Not well, getting, Paul, not well Paul, you know what? I, I think we have to know, have another conversation. So we'll, yeah, let's we'll, try and, we'll try and set that up. Um, but in the meantime, all the best to you. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up soon. Yeah, let's but uh, a huge thank you for tonight. So thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You.